friends, welcome into another edition of Deportes Nation, the soccer podcast. I'm Alex Parra. Beside me, you can see him. There he is. We welcome in Mr. Victor Araiza. Victor, I say this almost every podcast, depending on where you are, the time of day. Good day, good morning, good evening. How are you, Victor? How are you? You forgot the partner in crime, but <laughs> maybe we're not uh, we're not <laughs> committing crime anymore. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> hello, hello, Alex. Uh, always, always glad to be on here, and and hello to everybody listening, and anybody new listening. We're always glad to, to talk the beautiful game and and uh, give you at least something to laugh about. Yeah, well, we, we, we're they're certainly <laughs> laughing, uh, and maybe it's because of our lack of soccer knowledge or something. But uh, <laughs> no, it's 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 great to be with you, Victor. Yes, you are my partner partner in crime, I should say. It's great to be with you, and really, we do appreciate all of you that are following us, not only on YouTube, not only on social media. Um, and by the way, we want more of your comments, your questions. Uh, what stories would you like us to follow? I think that's part of all of this, Victor. You and I are blessed to be around this sport. But there's so many storylines at the professional level, at the college level, at the amateur level, at the federation level, uh, with the World Cup coming, with Copa America coming. Uh, it's, it's, it's really an exciting time for soccer in general terms. Probably too much to cover on a weekly basis. Would you, would you agree with me? It is. It, I mean, uh, again, it's year-round sport. Uh, you know, the tournaments we've talked about here are, are, are coming in heavy. Uh, every month, it seems like there's something new. Obviously, you know, we, we focus a lot on the pro level, but I mean, college, high school, we could, we could talk about soccer for days for sure. We could, and we're blessed to be able to do it, and we're grateful to all of you, ladies, gentlemen, friends. I like to use the word friends, also these days uh, that follow us here on the Portes Nation and the Soccer Podcast. Uh, Victor, why don't we kick off a little bit speaking about the pro game? In, in this case, why don't we talk a little bit about the team everyone's buzzing about, which is Miami. They continue to kick some booty. I can say it that way. It's a team that continues to win. Right now, in three matches, seven points. Messi and company, uh, by the way, they just beat up Orlando. But it's a team that's doing very, very, very well early here in the season. And this was uh, an absolutely dominating display, which is the difference between the first two matches, right? Uh, you know, the first one, they it was a 2 nothing game, but but there was a bit some struggles there, and obviously there there was going to be in the first game of the season. They went out to LA. That was a tie. This one, and Luis White is obviously getting his first goal uh, of the season, his first two goals, and, and the man, the way in which you know both were different. The first one was just all power. The second one, you know, a little bit of footwork inside the box for those who say he can't he can't move around anymore. Uh, Messi getting on the board as well. You know, this this latest. Um, Inter Miami exhibition was more of what people were expecting, and watch out if they if they can get on a roll here. Obviously, the season is still a lot of months long. Injuries can happen. There'll be management of the roster, but they're looking more like the Inter Miami that's favored to win the MLS Cup. And, and and is it too early to crown them? I know there's still a long season, but right now they're looking like a team that's at, that's at a different level, uh, Victor. And if they get going early, and like you said, there's a lot still that can happen. Um, injuries, uh, uh, other competitions, if you will, not too many, but it's, it's really a team that early on is setting the benchmark for what should be, uh, uh, I, I think, the standard in, in this league. So a long way to go, but uh, then, then, then I guess everyone else is going to be playing catch-up. Uh, that applies to the Houston Dynamo as well, and we'll talk about them in a little while. You know, right now it's 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 not even close. If you were to put them on the field together, it, it's not. But again, that's why it's still a long. It, it's not. But again, that's why it's still a long year. Uh, we don't know what injuries could happen, and I mean, it could go either way. They could still add more. It, it's not. But again, that's why it's still a long year. Uh, we don't know what injuries could happen, and I mean, it could go either way. They could still add more players and make them better. Uh, they have a few injuries themselves, so they, you know, that that's still to be sorted out. Uh, DeAndre Yedlin just got traded to Cincinnati, so that opens up some conversation of what, about what's going to happen at the right back right. Uh, position. And obviously, you know, here locally, Franco Escobar has been um, rumored with Inter Miami, and, and that might be just a kind of replacement. Obviously, a big Messi fan, a big Newell's fan, already played under Tata Martino in MLS, won an MLS Cup in Atlanta, so it would be probably a good fit there. 
and, and Prisco Arian you know, obviously wants to play on the right. So we'll we'll see how that develops. We'll keep an eye. Um, but I do think, you know, isn't this what, what we want in this league, though? Somebody sure. that does something different, somebody that uh, brings up the the challenge, that it's not just kind of everybody, um, you know, usually it'd be maybe an LAFC or, or depending on the year, Seattle. Uh, back a few years back, the Galaxy, when they had stars, but it's very few um, the teams that push the envelope, right, in the competitive level, especially this early in MLS. So to see some of this, you know, is it going to last? That's the hard part. But at least they're they're making talk, right? And at least it's pushing maybe indirectly a Houston Dynamo, for example, um, to eventually get to that kind of level or at least aspire to get to that kind of level, which is more than, than there has been in, in previous years. If you have to play versus Miami and you don't have the team to compete if you will, at their level, what do you do defensively? How do you start trying to keep them in check? You know, after the demo- demolition of, of Orlando, it's, it's other teams are thinking, man, we don't want them to do, that, to do that to us. What can we do? And I'm not saying you start playing anti-soccer, but certainly you think about, hey, how do I slow down Suarez? Hey, how do I slow down Messi? This is the balance. Attractive football for the league but also, if you're a coach, your pride and your professionalism are like, look, I don't want to lose to these folks. So it's a balance. Letting them score is, is, is not fun if you're the opponent. Fans love to see it, even the away fans. It is. It is obviously attractive <laughs> for fans. Um, few teams maybe have the players to, to match up with these kinds of teams. But that's a challenge, right? And yeah. Especially, you know, for defenders and you know, Here's one thing we don't talk about enough in MLS, right? Um, is the American player being developed? Is the American player benefiting? And I think, you know, if you're, you know, a young American uh, defender, isn't this the type of competition you want? Uh, even if it's uh, an older Luis Suarez, an older Lionel Messi, but at least, you know, a player that's been at the top, um, that has that extra gear that, you know, maybe a lot of players in MLS don't have, Um Again, I think this is only good for the league. If you have a problem with it, try and stop them, right? Um, and nothing's preventing other teams from signing players themselves. So, again, hopefully, you know, this is one of those, you know, the rising tide that lifts all boats uh, in MLS. And, and it lifts the competition level. And it gives us something to talk about here in March, which usually everybody's kind of taking it easy, taking it slow, getting the feel for the season. <laughs> I'm glad we have a team that's going for it. Hey, you know, at the very least, if they if they win a supporter shield, then they'll at least have a trophy. And, and that's part of the success they're trying to build, right? Setting the standard in MLS and continue on with the MLS, Victor, a little bit of a controversy out West more than anything when we had the team from, well, the home game, if you will, and Sandy, Utah, Real Salt Lakes and, uh, against LAFC, and it became basically a, uh, a winter storm. It, it was snow, snow, and more snow. Exciting, I think, for fans to watch this. But a lot of complaints, actually, from L.A., who ended up losing the game. Uh, what's your take on whether or not this game should have been played, Victor? It was delayed initially, then the storm came. And, and you're watching the highlights here with us as well. Uh, and, and it was there's no lines. You can't see the lines, Victor. Orange ball. This reminds me more of some Bundesliga matches I've seen or some Swedish soccer, but uh, not, not something we typically see in the MLS. Very, very few times, but we have seen it here. And, and, and this has been a reason why people say, well, this is why MLS should move to a European calendar because of this is March in some cities, right? Imagine December or January. I'm fine with it because... Isn't this what home field advantage is supposed to be? Sure. I mean, this is like people complaining about playing in the heat in Houston. And granted, we've had maybe some tougher temperatures than than in previous years, right? We're we're getting more record highs every year. Um, But again, when we talk about home field advantage, isn't this sort of what we talk about? I mean, I don't know if there's anything there um, from this game in Utah that's any different from some of the games we've seen in Europe. Um, Chirindolo has been, you know, a bit of a crybaby because he has <laughs> yeah, after some of these games, after some of these finals, which I think for, for a, a coach of, that has those type of players, I mean, it's, uh, you know, you're, you're crying about riches, right? I mean, it's, right. it's one game. You're playing it in Utah. Um, I don't know. To me, I don't see any controversy. You know, you compared, Victor, uh, the heat and humidity 
in Houston. And, and to be honest with you, if it's player safety, which is one of the issues that were raised, think about right. the heat index in Houston in June, July, August, when we have 90 plus degrees, when we have high humidity, it, it, and, and I would think that may be more dangerous than playing in the snow, to be honest with you. So, so it's all relative, right? And this is show business. Right. People want to see this. I, I think this might have gotten more eyeballs than if this game hadn't been played in the snow for the MLS. So it's a balance. You never want to put anyone in jeopardy. Uh, now stadiums, Victor, in, in, in my days, we never slow down for snow, for a thunderstorm. Now we know we've got to take shelter. Now we know we've got to delay matches. And that affects everything. The, the, the broadcasts, it affects the, the, uh, the coverage, etc. cetera. So uh, I think there, there are limits. But then do we go back the other way, Victor? Should there be a mandate, like in a lot of the other professional leagues in this country, the NFL, to have indoor stadiums and, and just keep it neutral? Don't worry about the weather. It will never be that a That could factor. be the case, but we just had a, a playoff game uh, up in Buffalo. We've had several games, you know, in, in some of these cities and, and that's a, a bit more contact, right? I mean, you know, the the frozen tundra in Green Bay. I mean, mm-hmm. these these have been some of the best games in American sports history, sure. I think. Um, again, I go back to home field. I think if it was unsafe, have the local authority to say, hey, look, you can't play in this weather. Um, every, you know, there's a bad effect, those sure. kinds of things. Um, seems to me like fans were able to get to the stadium. Um, a few of them. And, it wasn't packed. And again, <laughs> and again for for maybe that market, uh, you know that 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 wasn't you know super bad weather that obviously kept them from from playing this game. It wasn't you know obviously there's the lightning uh, policy in MLS, and I think that was part of, of of the delay here on Saturday. But other than you know maybe something like that where it's. Uh, endangers fans a little bit more. I mean, I think it's similar to what we say here in Houston. And, and I know a lot of people raise their hands and say, look, it's 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 uh, it's abnormal heat and you can't have fans or, or players out of these conditions. And, you know, maybe these are the things that if they're that harsh, uh, have to polish, be polished or be written uh, prior to playing these games. Yeah, yeah. So so there you see it, friends, the uh, the snowstorm that was in Sandy, Utah, and, and the effect it had on the match itself. Uh, a, again, a very interesting situation, and, and it, 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 it talks about not only the weather changes and the diversity of weather and cities here in, in the MLS League. So something, something really, really, really interesting. Uh, Victor, as we switch gears, uh, talking about the MLS, uh, wrapping up, um, uh, the start here of the season or starting up the 2024 season, but news today precisely about the All-Star game, a, a tradition now uh, in the MLS. That's right. It's going back to the MLS versus Liga MX format, which I liked. Um, obviously, you know, as a Mexican-American, I'm a little bit more invested in both leagues. Um, so I know more of the players. Um, you know, I don't know, maybe, maybe for somebody that doesn't follow the Mexican league as much, uh, maybe follows the Premier League more for them. The other format of you know MLS versus a European team, maybe a Premier League team like it was last year against Arsenal. Maybe that's a more attractive format. Um, I like it because I do think this is more of an All Star feel where you get the best players and and there is more of a um, of a competitive spirit, right? Because there is a rivalry between both leagues and especially between uh, both soccer cultures, the U.S. and Mexico. Um, it's not the NBA All-Star game, right? That's what I'm trying to say. It's not just guys not defending, running around, striking up points, and it, it really is a, a glorified exhibition game. I think there really is something at play here in, in this one. You know, you, you well, yes, the rivalry is natural. It's, it's cultural. It's social in so many ways. I, I'm, I'm down on All-Star games in general. I, I think a lot of the athletes have decided, and you were pointing to the NBA, uh, you know, there used to be... Um, uh, the NFL uh, used to go out to uh, to to, to uh, Hawaii and have their so-called All-Star game, right? The 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 pro the Pro Bowl, right? Uh, and and right. now it's flag football. Uh, this is fun to interact with the with the players um, and take a day or two and, and represent your club. Uh, but but I don't take it seriously. Is my point, Victor? I, I I don't think it's competition per se. It's more fun as it should be, and it's okay to be lighthearted about it. The history of this also goes back to the days when the, they used to have the shootout. There were different rules. 
maybe these are moments when you, 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 you present it that way, a celebration of the league, a friendly against Liga MX All-Stars. I think it's fun. I think it's cool. And, 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 and I think that's the way it should be presented. Um, I'll be honest with you. At some point, I think some clubs might say, you know what, I just want the, the days off. Uh, you guys take all the time you want. Give me time to rest and recuperate. Maybe that's part of this, you know, a, a traditional break, if you will, in, in the calendar. That That is, you know, part of it now. And, in, in, you know, not just this All-Star game, but in, you know, probably – like you mentioned it, you know, in football and American football and in the NBA, um, again, as long as there's a competitive spirit to this, I, I think it is fun for fans. And especially, um, you know, I remember when, you know, as a kid watching some of these games and, and, you know, that's, you know, it is, it is a pickup game, but it is, you know, the best against the best. And if you have, um, that competitive spirit in it, it makes for an interesting game sure. and it is something different and it is a bit of a, of a recess from the league. You know, even if it was East versus West, I person as an MLS fan, I'd, I'd like that. Um, I know in years prior, maybe there wasn't enough teams or, or maybe, you know, just, just didn't have enough talented players that drew money to fill these stadiums. Now that you got Messi here, right. And you can put him maybe in an Eastern conference team and you got, uh, you know, Western Conference team that could have an Hector Herrera with a with a Denis Buanga, um, you know, Rui Diaz, or you know, and, and pull the best from from both leagues. Maybe that would have been a, a good format to go. Um, it did surprise me that they went back to MLS versus Liga MX because I thought the whole reason they stopped that was because of the League's Cup, and you know, Mexican teams didn't want to let their players, you know, have to play the League's Cup and then also have to play an All Star game. So that is, you know, maybe it is sort of a kickoff to the League's Cup, but. Um, yeah, we'll see how it goes this this third round. I like the first two where it was MLS versus Liga MX like, again because of that competitive spirit. Because I don't think we see that where it's you know MLS versus Chelsea or MLS versus Barcelona yeah. or MLS versus Bayern Munich. Um, yeah, we'll we'll see how it goes. But I think as long as it's competitive, it it could be a great um, a great advertisement for the league. And again, it if it goes back to what All Star games are traditionally supposed to be. Um, wouldn't you want to see the best face the best? You would. Uh, ideally, that's that's what you want, and you want them to be out there competing for for their for their pride, for their league, and, and make it interesting. So we'll see what happens uh, later on this this year for the All Star Game and the MLS. Switching gears, but staying with the MLS now to the local team, the team you and I cover since last we had our Deportes Nation the Soccer Podcast. Uh, Victor, there was uh, well, there's been two matches. The first one for the Dynamo. Um, was uh, the second leg of the CCC. I call it uh, the CONCACAF Champions Cup, if you will. And, and going into that match, Houston was in trouble. Uh, they were down 0-1. Um, sorry, they were down 2-1 in the, in, the, in, the, uh, in the score, and they needed a 1-0 victory at home. So uh, let's talk about that a little bit. What were your impressions of that match? Well, we had talked about it. I mean, I think maybe during the scope of the season, uh, mid-year in MLS, if you put these two teams together, maybe St. Louis gets the better end of it, uh, like we saw last year. Um, but this is obviously, you know, both teams coming out of preseason. I think that benefited the Dynamo even with with the injuries. Um, that was an important result. You know, St. Louis could have absolutely, I think, and I know they're coming out of preseason, but come, you know, the best eleven, I think they could have probably gotten a better a better score at home. Uh, for Houston to come out of it, especially with the away goals, uh, with that two to one, um, all they needed to do was was you know win one nothing at home, and we've sure. seen them do that you know here in the Ben Olsen era at Shell Energy Stadium. So I think if that's all they needed, uh, that was something doable, and that was something that you know we saw them carry out. You know they finally got that one goal; they were able to see out the result over the weekend. You know maybe it didn't work <laughs> as well because they got the goal early on in the. Uh, in the encounter and, and, you know, defending for the last 30 minutes of the game or so, like they had to do against St. Louis, where, as opposed to defending most of the game. Um, that was the challenge on Saturday, but absolutely, they got to uh, advance. Um, they get two more games, which, you know, coming up here in a week where they're not going to have an MLS game, uh, maybe keeps them on the field, gives more opportunity to younger players. And, and we'll see as far as they can go. I will say, and uh, i got to give a shout-out to Cesar Procel for this uh, on nah, the show don't, on, on don't, don't, in the radio. You can't mention Cesar. You uh, know, his head's no. going to get big now. And... 
No. Okay, you raised a good point though. If you look at the bracket, not that I don't know, I don't think it's going to happen, but in theory, um, the Dynamo or, or well, you know, some of these MLS could go through um, and win the thing without ever having to face anybody outside of MLS. True. That, True. That's how many MLS teams we have in this competition. And and does that then dilute what this is? And 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 let me let me address that a little bit as we continue watching the highlights of, of that uh, of that second leg. Uh, where the Dynamo won at home. Uh, Victor, I, I was disappointed by a couple of things. It seemed to me, it seemed to me that, that St. Louis came out to play, but you know what? They're like, okay, we lost. I, it, I did not sense a disappointment. Uh, yes, they're professionals, but I didn't sense, oh man, this is, this is not what we want. This is, I don't think they were loving it. They were like, okay, let's go home. Let's get on. Let's get ready for the next thing. A very busy calendar. Number one, and number two, Victor, I don't have the answer. I don't pretend to have the answer. But now I understand better why MLS is saying, look, U.S. Open Cup, for us to have three to 5,000 people, it, it's, it's not even worth turning on the lights. It, I, I get it. This is a business first, a business last, and that's what drives this. And, and for the low attendance for the CCC at Shell, you know, it was disappointing. It, it was two, two good teams. It was exciting for the most part. I'll use that, those terms for now. But perhaps. Was perhaps. It, was, I, it, was it the late start? We talked about this before. Was it the, the, the middle of the week? Meaning, why, why, is it, why is this being forced? It seems forced for everyone, and no one wants well, to say the that. Well, it's the regional competition. You can make the argument that what's forced here is the League's Cup, because that's the one that, you know, I like it because it's MLS versus Liga MX, but competitively it has no place in, in, in some of these... Uh, the rest of these cups, right? Because the U.S. Open Cup is is a domestic cup between all U.S. teams. Uh, this one, the Concacaf Champions Cup, this is a, the crown for the region. This is our version of the Champions League. This gives you the ticket uh, to go to the Club World Cup and potentially yeah. face a European team or sure. or a South American champion, sure. right? Sure. Um, sure. That's what's at stake here. Uh, I like it. I wish again, like the Open Cup. I wish there was more attention to it. You know, part of it I go back to, you know, I agree with your point of view where you say, you know, is it even worth it for turn on the lights? I would say, you know, part of it, too, is what are you giving the fans to come out uh, to, to watch some of these games? If they faced Inter Miami in that game, I bet you that stadium would have been full. It didn't matter if it was 930 p.m. People would have been there to watch that game. Um, and maybe, that, again, that speaks to the level in the region, um, you know, having stars on the field. What are you presenting to the fan to get him to come out? And, you know, we can get into it here in a little bit, but the, I mean, even just the MLS product here in Houston, it's not drawing full crowds uh, to show Energy Stadium. And I think that more than anything uh, has to be part of the conversation. I mean, we're going to give the owners a pass here uh, for not putting, uh, you know, more quality players on the field. Uh, when again, the answer is kind of easy, isn't it? It is, Victor. Uh, uh, I go back to it, and, and, and let, me, let me finish my point about the, these competitions beyond MLS regular season. Back to it being forced. Do I like it? Of course I like it. Is, do we know the pathway where that would lead? Uh, you know, the U.S. Open Cup, if we started the Deportes Nation team and we won our league and we went through the amateur ranks, we could one day potentially play. I love that Cinderella story possibility. But, but Victor, th what drives this is reality. Reality is business. At some point, if we're getting three to 5,000 people, be it U.S. Open Cup, be it CCC, you've got to make a business decision and say, look, this isn't helping anyone. Oh, on top of that, my players are getting hurt. Oh, on top of that, they're getting fatigued. Oh, on top of that, we're not making money, which is the main reason we're here. I, I get why MLS, who is dominating and controlling the U.S. Soccer Federation, and that's another topic to, th to talk about, they're going to go in a different direction. And why not then, And I, I, as I think this through from a business perspective, Victor, turn it over to the second or third team, turn it over to, my, turn it over to Dynamo Dos, turn it over to somebody else. That's logical, and you can do that's that. natural. You can do that. I, I think they have done that. 
What's crazy about this whole thing, and we, we can kind of dive into it as well. Obviously, the U.S. Open Cup announcement came just last week. Only eight MLS teams will be in. Uh, the Houston Dynamo is is one of them. Uh, they get back because they're the uh, defending, defending champ, champion. Yeah. Which, which by the way, uh, going back to Concacaf uh, Champions Cup, that should be a roar in in Concacaf as well. Why shouldn't the defending champion come back the next season and defend their championship? The UEFA Champions League does it. Um, Again, it, why shouldn't all the MLS teams be in the Open Cup? If you don't want to send your first team, send your MLS. Sure. We put put your MLS two uh, team, your MLS next pro teams uh, in you know your first team jerseys and just put them out there. Um, what's the problem with that? I think. I mean, are we? And, and that's the thing to me. You, you've hit it right on the head. It's about business. It's about making money. It's not about the product on the field. And that's the truth. But 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 look, Victor, I'm I'm going to be devil's advocate here. That's not a bad thing. That's just reality. If you've got a limited budget and a limited audience, because a Tuesday night, Wednesday night, seven thirty, eight thirty, nine thirty start during the school year in Houston is not going to sell. It it, it just isn't. Uh, like you said, and we're gonna, we're going to dive into the highlights of uh, of, uh, of New York Red Bull and Houston Dynamo. Even even weekend matches. In, in 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 Houston aren't selling so so something's got to give and, and I think maybe I like your thinking your reality which is yeah we're going to use our second team our third team and we're going to play at the Sabercat Stadium and it is what it is Victor and five thousand people not? show up there we should we the team should have that input and that choice and it breaks my heart when about these competitions in particular the U.S. Open Cup to me that's uh, over a century of soccer tradition, it should be taken as such. It should be sold as such. And I think U.S. Soccer Federation is waking up to say, look, we've got to do something because otherwise this is going to go back to my old days when a couple of wins from a local amateur team and that's who's winning this. And, and then what does that mean to, to U.S. soccer? Um, so a lot of purists, I understand, want everyone in, all in, and, and the Cinderella story is great, but that doesn't... That doesn't pay the bills, ladies and gentlemen. It hurts me to say that, Victor. That's what I see. No, and, and I agree in part with that. I also think that, you know, a lot of sports teams uh, aren't necessarily there to make a profit. I'm not saying that they shouldn't make a profit. Um, but I do think that, you know, in this give and take, I don't see a lot of give back to the game, right? Uh, I, I just don't. I don't see... Um, how do we grow the game? It's always about how am I going to make money? How are we going to uh, sell these seats? How we, and that's, you know, again, that to me is is the big challenge here um, and why a lot of fans don't respond uh, to some of these clubs. And, you know, you think narrowing down the selection, okay. Um, but the biggest thing here is community, right? We saw some of these Gold Cup games here. Yeah. Um, and some local teams that got out to to watch some of these games, and I've seen this at Dash, I've seen this at Dynamo. Um, again, I, I get your point. You know, why am I going to give tickets away? It's a business. Um, it's a, it could also be a learning moment for a lot of teams, right? You could fill that stadium. Um, you know, I think we heard a lot of children this last game uh, on, on Saturday, and, and the energy they brought to the game. And how, you know, even with, with the lesser attendance, it sounded uh, like the crowd was a little bit more into it. Um, why not subsidize it in that way? But again, yeah, I well, mean, we're talking about clubs in MLS, for example, yeah. um, that instead of marketing the team, instead of trying to put, you know, growing the game, um, you know, latest thing I heard with the Dynamo was season ticket boxes. They're asking people to come down to the office, drive themselves down to pick them up. Uh, because a club can't pay a couple postages to send out boxes. I mean, is this really how we're skimping and trying to make a buck? Victor, it's it's a business. It's a business. And, and, and again, that's not a dirty word, but I do understand. And look, I think we come back to the word we're going to use throughout uh, our, our, our presentation of many of these, many of these themes, which is balance. I, I like your idea. Why don't you fill up uh, versus Columbus that's coming up? and you give away tickets to every youth club, and you've got 20,000 strong, yes, and you gave it away. Is that not better than having 3,000 people actually pay? You find a balance. You give back to the community in that way. What is there to lose at that point? 
open it up. Maybe you sell some more popcorn and, and, and a couple of, 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 of uh, I guess it's $8 beers. I don't drink beer, but I imagine that's how much it costs. That would be the business way of thinking it, right? The right? smart business way of thinking it. Hey, okay, so maybe I'm losing at the gate, but look, I'm not selling anything uh, by having a thousand people here. Why not just get more people in the stadium and, and, and at least and make some money on concessions? And sell some purple jerseys. There you go. There you go. You see, I'm not as dumb as I look, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Speaking of purple jerseys, you see them now on screen talking about the latest uh, match at home for the Houston Dynamo. And uh, they took on the team from New York Red Bull. Um, it, it was an emotional match, and we talk about that in a little while for, for many of us. But uh, again, um, the team trying to still figure out how to deal with injuries, uh, Victor. But talk us through your impressions of, of this latest home match that Houston had at Shell. Well, we spoke some of it in the recap, uh, just to kind of, you know, go over it. Early goal. You know, last, yeah. last year, right. Last year, we, we've seen some of these games from the Houston Dynamo, right? I don't think those teams did enough, um, you know, to challenge them here at Shell Energy Stadium. I don't think they, you know, sometimes maybe they got lucky that they, you know, a player or two didn't perform uh, to their potential or, or, you know, maybe the team didn't have a player that could hurt them in that sense. And the Dynamo got away with a result here or there, right? I think now you're starting to see um, these games are there for the taking. And when you have a guy like an Emil Forsberg and, yeah. and a Lewis Morgan, um and you give them opportunities like like you have been doing in these games. These are going to be the results. And, you know, part of it is the injuries. Part of it is the congested schedule. Um, but, again, I think part of it is the style of play. Um, you're going to score one goal and then defend for the rest of the game. I think that's um, one that I think that's a shame to see because, again, the Dynamo playing at home to defend in their own half in the, in, in the first 45 minutes, I think, you know, that's not a spectacle. That's not entertaining. Um, you know, if you come away with it with the result, sure, you can justify it. But in this case, they're not, they can't justify it anymore. The results are now, they, they've dropped five points at home. And let's hope, again, they don't dig themselves into a hole before they get somebody like Hector Herrera back who can start to, to help them go in the other direction. Victor, that, that question about the, the style uh, was asked uh, to Ben Olsen in, in the post game, I, I was there. Well, you were there too. You were working some other interviews. But, but he was asked, and he goes, look, we're going to go for it. It, it. My point is this. We're hearing from Ben Olsen saying, no, we don't sit back on a 1-0 lead. We are still aggressive. We're <laughs> the still video attractive. says otherwise. The, 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 <laughs> the evidence is that there is no risk, that it's very calculated to be in control, in possession, but without really causing danger. And then you get a team that gets hungry, a team that is be very good team, solid. You, you mentioned Amir Fransberg, number 10, tremendous player. They came in with leadership. He came in with energy, something this club needed. Um, you also were, were very correct in the recap, mentioning the, 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 the youth and the academy program that this entity globally has in Europe, here in the United States. But, but my point is, uh, Victor, even though he didn't want to say it, I don't think we will ever have it admitted, sitting back with, 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 with one goal may be enough in this league. And 80% and of the time it is because you don't have someone that can chase and go after that. And that type of environment breeds many of the 1-0 matches or the 1-1 matches that we see. It certainly wasn't the goal fest that we just watched uh, from Miami. I think you can get away with it like they did uh, last year. I think you can get away with it for a season. I think if you're building consistency over years, you have to have a balance. Yeah. Um, you know, again, I don't, I don't begrudge them for playing defensively. I'm not against playing defense. I, I appreciate uh, good defense. But I think they're unbalanced. Uh, they're very unbalanced. Uh, they were last year with, with the way um, they couldn't generate goals. And they're in the similar situation this year. Um, obviously, Ferreira got injured. But, I mean, it, it's, you know, they're limited with Siegel. Uh, whenever he was playing, they tried to put Aliyu back in that position. Um, you know, the creation and, and 
you know, getting goals in the back of the net. That we said that was going to be a problem, and you know, we'll see if they can address it. But uh, unless Hector Herrera's on the field, I mean, it, it seems like you know you may not be able to catch lightning in the bottle a second year in a row and go all the way to the Western Conference final. Maybe they will, and maybe it all turns out, and that's why there's also a lack of urgency, right, in MLS, because it's a long season, because, you know, you have all the way till you know, around September to get it together, maybe. Um, you know, as long as you're in the hunt, you're in the hunt, you get in the last minute, and you're in the playoffs. So, you know, we'll see where, where you know, this season goes, but I think if they don't make the playoffs or if they struggle, um, these are the things we'll be pointing at. It's still early. It's something we talked about in the recap, but then it's also early for teams like Miami. But Miami, seven points. The Dynamo, one point. Yes, they've played one more game, meaning Miami. Uh, the Dynamo only with two. Uh, quickly, uh, let's talk about, Victor, the, the, the attendance again. I, I was once again disappointed uh, at Shell to, to not have a sellout, and, and I think we're going to see more of this and maybe it getting worse before it gets better. Do you agree? I think it stays the same. Uh, unfortunately, that's it's what the reality is here in Houston. Uh, you know, we mentioned it. It's still astonishing to me, and I know he's not playing at the moment, but how you have a, uh, you know, for years we asked for for a star of this caliber in, in our city uh, for this team, um, a Mexican national team star. You finally have it with Hector Herrera, and it's almost like he's invisible. It's almost like he's not even in town. Um, you don't hear about him. You don't, I mean, and, and I don't mean like just, you know, the coverage here and there that, that you see regularly on, on the, you know, on Univision or Telemundo, but I'm talking about, you know, you saw J.J. Watt when he was in Houston, right? You can't go around Houston and not hear about C.J. Stroud or Jose Altuve. And I think you have a player of that, that you could have of that caliber and you're not there doing anything to feed that buzz. And that's a part of, you know, I've, I've talked about their marketing efforts. I've talked about, you know, their, their media efforts. And I know, I, again, I go back to investment because if you can spend um, to renovate the stadium, if you can spend on, on making this a profitable business, to me, that's part of a profitable business, your staff, sure. your efforts, um, you know, commercials, billboards, whatever it may take, if you truly want to fill up that stadium, um, you, and I don't think they're doing enough. And the other side of it, we talked about the community part of it. Are you suggesting, Victor, that Hector Herrera, who's injured, and I think that's legit, and we saw him at the stadium. He's been at both um, regular season home matches. Uh, we, we, he's, he's interacting with his team. He's continuing the, 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 the physical work, the mental work that goes into rehabbing. But are you suggesting that maybe... I, I'm throwing this out there. Maybe Hector gets on one of the local sp Spanish broadcasts and, and is a, a guest commentator. Uh, it, you're right. His lack of visibility, which is a fact, I, unless we're missing it, I'm missing it, and no one's yeah. watching him. We, we don't know if he's on the field. We don't know when he's coming back. He's, gonna, he's not going to be rushed. We know that much. But the way we saw him limping earlier this week, um, I think this is months yet to come, Victor. So is there another it way is, he can contribute? Is, is, is that what you're suggesting? Well, uh, no, I'm, in another I'm, not, way. I'm not putting it entirely on Herrera and, and maybe go, going that route, you know, because of the current injury. Uh, you know, I'm just talking about the marketing of the team, the stars, right? At the very least, there should be, uh, you know, the decoration around the stadium, um, you know, just like we've seen at the Toyota Center with, with some banners of the Rockets players, Um you know, at NRG Stadium with banners of the Texans players. I mean, there should there should at least be um, that you can market uh, a Carrasquilla. You can market some of the players, Fiachenko, uh, Steve Clark, um, you know, Kovalkic, uh, I mean, Basi. I mean, you, you can do more with some of these. Um, you know, I get there in, in a little bit of a congested schedule, but. Um, Maybe not the starters. Drop some of the, the, the players on, on the lower end of the roster. Um, community appearances, again, get, you know, if you're not filling up the stadium, give away some tickets. I mean, we know they do that anyways. I mean, so fill up the, the, the place at least. Uh, get 20000 in there. I mean, you, you've, we've seen sort of flashes of what this could be if they put this together. And to me, a lot of it isn't, again, it, 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 to me, it's lack of trying. Victor, I, I, I'm going to give you a slightly different take as, as I better analyze, think through the current situation of a team that, that is not filling up a stadium. 
uh, and, and I'm going to be very blunt about it. I think the regular customer, the MLS soccer fan, is tapped out. I, I think that's it. You're going to have between 15 and 20,000 of those. On a good day, 20. On a not so good day, 15. If this franchise wants to grow, and they're not asking for my advice, it's my observation, it needs to go beyond the core MLS fan. It doesn't mean you push the core MLS fan aside. It just means you find a different way to find the casual soccer fan, the fan that may not believe in the league, may not be interested in the league, may not know about Hector Herrera. There's still a lot of people in the city that don't know who that is, Victor. That's the truth. Hector Herrera could walk through certain parts of town and have nobody recognize him. That's a fact. That's a fact. It may be, if, if he's driving to the side of town, there's no Mexicans. Yes, I, I agree no, with that. No, that's, that's hard not to find Mexicans in our city. <laughs> Otherwise, <laughs> I don't see it. <laughs> now, in some posh restaurants, he may be, uh, like some of us, uh, a lot more popular in the kitchen area than in the dining area. Well, <laughs> at the very least, they'll recognize him. That's my point. I, it, it's very hard for me to fathom that he's... And again, that's why it's, it's hard to... Uh, you know, see why this team doesn't make more of a dent in the local media landscape and, and just in, in, well, in look, the look, uh, sports uh, uh, landscape. Victor, I, I think what you just mentioned is the core of all of this. I'm going to say this because to me, this is who we are. We Latinos, Hispanics, Latin X. I'm still trying to figure that one out. Someone, someone threw <laughs> that word in there a few years ago. Um, I guess it means, it means who we are. Uh, we're the majority as far as numbers, Spanish speaking or not. And I, maybe I'm going to repeat myself over and over until someone says, okay, I get it now. This isn't complicated. You should have the face of your franchise be Maria Sanchez for the dash and Hector Herrera. And every day that should be your message. Every well, day, uh, every day. I that mean, isn't that who they are? Your message. Yes. Isn't that who they are? But they're not, I don't, but do, they're not but, doing but, enough with them. But where do you see that? Do you see that on Fox 26? I don't. Do you see that well, on, on do you see that on billboards? I did see a billboard. No, no. I did see a billboard with uh, Maria. One time with Maria. Oh, I was going Oh, I've, I've yet to see that one. On on, on 59 somewhere as I, ah, okay. as, I, yeah. I was, as I was parked there on my way to the yeah, stadium. Yeah, you, you might be right. It might be like you you could barely I mean But 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 yeah. okay. But billboards to me You are could old. barely tell it's Maria. Yeah. But sure. To me, billboards are old school. You know, you go back to this. You're younger than me. You're more conservative when it comes to traditional means. I, I, Alex, I think. <laughs> you know how many thousands of cars yes. pass by yes. every yeah. day? Yes. I and you know it. how many people sit in traffic? Oh, yes. Many of us. But I get it. I get it. And listen to the radio. You reminded me of this one. <laughs> and with newspapers still. Well, I don't know about that. There's a couple of crazy people like you who still do that. Who still get your That's chronicle? Right. You still no. get your, your printed yeah. chronicle on Sunday morning for the coupons. All that, all that this quick, because uh, I, I want to counter something you said. Please. Um, you're right. They should they should add to what they have as as a core fan base, um, and then expand from there. But also, they shouldn't ignore their core no. fan base, and I think that's that's also been part of the problem over the years that they've pushed away what has been their core MLS fan base. And if you just win those back. I think you could fill up the stadium based on just that. And and that's another thing that we've, you know, when we talk about community and we talk about all these efforts, I mean, that that to me, that's where you start. It, it's a balance. We're going to keep using that word, I believe, in, 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 in appreciating your current fans and trying yeah. to work, because it's work, for for new fans, for, 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 for new people, people that have not come to Shell to, to get a glimpse of the product. And look, the product is entertainment. That's that's the bottom line. Often, as you've mentioned, and we are more soccer purist that we 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 care about the product. Uh, but for many casual fans, Victor, I go back to it. It's it's goal scoring. You put two or three in the back of the net, and 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 that's what people want to see. That excitement, yeah, that build up. It's touchdowns. It's home runs. I agree. That's got to be the focus. So defense is not a dirty word. You can win championships with defense. But at times, to attract the new audience, um, you've got to give them what, what they want, which is, which is the offensive output. Uh, Victor, we're going to close uh, our recap of, of the Dynamo um, with, with what happened at the stadium this past, um, this past Saturday. 
as, as you know, um, the, the Dynamo, the DASH organization did a great job in, in honoring, in remembering uh, Maggie McKeith and our, our, our journalist um, team member, if you will. Um, her sudden and shocking passing has affected a lot of us deeply. Uh, but talk us through, sir, what, what, what you saw uh, this past Saturday relative to, to the remembrance by the team, please. Yeah, look, I I criticize them a lot for what they what they don't do. In this one, I I applaud them, I I commend them uh, for what they did here, and and remembering, um, you know, an esteemed colleague and somebody that over the past year has has put a lot of effort into trying uh, to grow the game, especially in the mainstream. Yeah. Again, for everything I just told you about them needing to be out there more. Uh, Here's somebody on the media side uh, that was going above and beyond, honestly, um, because, you know, we've talked about how much, whether the sport sells or not, uh, how much attention there really is. But here was somebody at a at a local station putting in an extra effort to get this team attention. Um, and and I, you know, remember still at the last training uh, that we got to cover together where she, um, you know, she must have just came straight from from producing and she was out there at at show stadium and um you know as she said just to give the team coverage because nobody else covers it and um she will be missed because for more than that um and i'm glad the dynamo you know honored her and and i can't think of a better way you know with what they're doing here with the scholarship uh, in her name um a future journalist will get to to have that uh, benefit and and that'll be her legacy and I hope it's it's not just a one time thing and it continues and I think again these are the things that um th these are the things that pull us to this sport and this is the things that make this sport a community and and again I just I I hope it continues um, and I hope it doesn't just uh, fade away um, and and everything else you know we've said on on Saturday I mean it's just just it, it it's still Unbelievable to think that, that she's no longer here. Yeah. And and uh, I think she inspired a lot of us to to ha match that energy that she brought uh, her, to bring you to bring you coverage. Her her loss our loss is is as I analyze it and, and I try to analyze something that's still too too close, too soon as they say, to think about it other than being shocked and other than uh, uh a punch to the gut, Victor, but you, you hit on something. She was, and I think will be, the next generation. You mentioned that she was remembered. Um, friends, also the Dynamo Dash have set up a scholarship in her name um, to help another, to help, to, to, to yes, I guess to help a, a, a young woman who wants to go into sports journalism, if, if I'm getting right, the details through Dynamo Charities. Um, uh, we need to have more women that are involved in journalism. We need to have more women of the new generation following this sport. That's what's going to sustain it. Not, not an old man like me who, who's jaded and has lived the, 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 the dark ages of soccer. And, and again, even though we may be critical, uh, this is still a good time for, for our sport. But she was that next generation, Victor, and her energy, her pursuit to push and elevate our sport to the mainstream, I'm going to use those words intentionally, was contagious. It made me want to work harder to be an advocate of our sport. It made me want to uh, uh, um, get out there more and say, look, 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 at the, look what we can do together. She brought that. And um, we're going to miss that. I'm going to miss that. I, I was able to be with some of our colleagues a little bit, Victor, on, on Saturday, and, and they were still devastated by it all. And, and it, didn't, it doesn't make sense, let me put it that way. It doesn't make sense. Um, it's not right, it's not fair. Um, but I think the message, one of the messages beyond love, Victor, that we have to take from this is, how can we keep our legacy going? So uh, I, like you, am grateful to the organization for what they have done in setting up the scholarship. We will continue talking about that and much, much more. But I'll let you, sir, have the last word uh, for now uh, uh, about Maggie. I mean, I, I think we've kind of said uh, most of 
you know, again, uh, you're right. Uh, just the energy, I think, you know, that's been used. That's a word that's been used a lot, uh, especially around this club in the past couple of years. But, um, I mean, that's probably the best way to describe her. Uh, and she was go, go, go. And um, and it was refreshing. I, you know, I, I always welcome new coverage. It's always great to see it from the mainstream. Um, you know, there's just, there's just several different moments. Uh, you know, one of them, right, uh, there was an interview Nate Griffin did one time on Fox 26. And... And here's an example, right, of a producer helping, you know, behind the scenes, you, you know, maybe you don't see her. Um, Nate's on, on camera. He's doing an interview with Pat Onstead. And he's like, hold on, before I let you go, Pat, I, you know, I got I got to ask you because I got Maggie in my ear. Uh, who's the starting forward this season? And that's when we got the answer, you know, Sebastian Ferreira. And, and like, that's, you know, the efforts you don't see right behind the scenes. But I mean, you know, again, um and I'm sure Nate Griffin, Nate Griffin will tell you too. I mean, he's sure. not going to be the most polished on soccer. And, and, and Maggie, I think we've told you is the same, but I don't know if she considered herself an expert. I, I, I doubt it, but, you know, but she put the effort to cover the game, to give it its space. Um, and, and that's why, for you know, for the game here in the city, that that's also a big loss. Um, but, but again, just, uh, just as a person, uh, nothing bad to say about her. I've, I've never, I don't think I ever saw her angry. I never saw her sad. Um, anything, any moment I, I saw her, it was, it was all joy. And, uh, and it's, it's just, you know, again, maybe it's, it's a joy that we're going to miss a lot in our lives. Absolutely. Victor. And, and thank you for that. And, and friends, thanks to all of you for, for, um, for trying to find out more about Maggie. So, Maggie, Maggie, we miss you, we love you, and, and, and may she rest in peace. Um, there's no easy transition from that, Victor, but we'll do our best to, to continue here in, in the segments that we have left on the Portas Nation, this soccer podcast. And, and, Victor, let's talk a little bit about the last match relative to what's going on in the league when it comes to referees. Um, the scabs, as some of them, of some people are calling them, um, it's still, the, the quality wasn't awful from what I saw in, in the, the New York Red Bull match versus Houston Dynamo FC. Uh, there's been a few questionable um, decisions, like there always will be. Well, what's the latest? Right. Uh, obviously, the, 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 the league and the, the, the union, the sindicato, still haven't made, kissed and made up yet. They haven't. They're still, they're still wrestling with, with numbers. And it sounds like they're nowhere close. And that's a shame because it's, again, Um, maybe it's hard, uh, it, you know, with all the, cause, cause there is partly, it, there is a culture of abuse with referees and there's not a lot of them, not a lot of people maybe signing up. Um, and, and we see that obviously across all sports, not, not just soccer, right. We see it in baseball, basketball, but, um, you know, I think maybe, maybe that's a part of it. And point here, um, we are getting some errors, you know, we're getting some blunders now where the Miami game. Uh, would have had an Inter Miami fan uh, refing the game if not for social media, uh, bringing this to light quickly, and and it, I mean, that could have been a big egg on the league's face if this had, you know, for as embarrassing as it might have been. Uh, imagine if these this would have these pictures would have came out after the game. I mean, it would have looked horrible on the league. Uh, you know, Miami winning five nothing, and and the ref is an Inter Miami fan. Um, I think. You know, we saw it years ago in the NFL when they had replacement refs. And unfortunately, what it took is an embarrassing mistake to get the league and the refs to sit down and and get some pull something together. And unfortunately, I think that's where we're headed. The way the way this is going week to week, I think they're essentially betting or they're essentially waiting for a big mistake 
that unfortunately, and because, you know, this is a league that's getting a lot of attention here with, with Messi and hopefully it doesn't happen in the Miami game, but they're just waiting for that one big mistake uh, to bump in their face uh, to settle the situation when they should be more proactive about it. You know, Victor, and, and we just showed the, uh, the image uh, from the MLS referee stats account about this referee who, who was uh, very proud to be wearing his Messi jersey and taking photos of it. Uh, uh, clearly a conflict of interest. At least a good decision was made prior to that referee stepping on the field. Look, I, I, I go back to my changing of my position on referees over the years as I've matured and grown in our need for referees. Um, they are, they are the, the, the front lines of, of, of upholding the purity of the game. Unfortunately, coaches, fans, players have decided that the referees are evil. I think that's part of this. Dev menospreciar. I like that word in, in, in Spanish. They have kind of cast aside the importance of referees. The assumption is, oh, they're going to be, they're awful anyway. Let's not even give them the time of day. Why should we deal with this? They're, the good ones, Victor, are professionals. The good ones not only train physically, but train their mind to react quickly under pressure situations. I'm going to go out on a limb, Victor, and say that any of you that complain about a, refi, a referee or a ref, match, I challenge you to try to referee even at the youth level and do it well. It's not only, hey, calling off sides. And by the way, you've got to be in position to do that correctly, do that promptly or not, or know when advantage happens. We are fans, many of us, that yell at the referee when our team and our selfish interests aren't met. But that's not what this sport is about. It's almost like being a judge, Victor. You've got to uphold the law, the loss of the game. And the way to do that is to be honest. The way to do that is to be balanced. The way to do that is to not be biased, to be objective if you can. And you know what? Often in sport, it's emotion that takes over, not only for the participants, but certainly for the fans. And that's the downfall of the place of referees. They cannot be seen as this ref was, trying to be in favor of one or the other. They're very guarded. Victor, I'm gonna say this because I think it's true. Normally, we, some of us journalists, go through a certain path and tunnel to the backstage area for press conferences. This year, they've closed off that passage, that hall, because it's where the referees are. There is that much potential harm to referees that they're even keeping people who I believe are, are good people, not only myself, but others. Well, there was, the, well, there was the incident last year with uh, Matt Miaska in, in the playoffs. Sure. Um, and, and I guess there's, there's been different reported versions of it, but ultimately, you know, MLS handed a suspension because, you know, he, he, as a player, you can't be going into the referee no. locker room after. And I think, and yeah, the, you know, that, and, and I don't know if that's completely a separate conversation, but I do agree that that's part of the, the issue here, the the abuse of referees, and, and like you said, men, you know, los menospreciamos. We we undervalue them. Um, you know, again, play a game without fans in the stands. Play a game without a referee. I mean, it's not the same. It's it's a part. It's a piece of the puzzle for for soccer. And um, again, it's it's difficult to see how the league is just going along without getting this settled, um, or even being anywhere close to getting this settled. Uh, to me, it's a mistake to continue this way uh, much longer. Hopefully, it, it finally sees a resolution. But I think the way it's going, unfortunately, they're waiting for a big mistake to happen, to be at the focus of international media. And it's going to be an embarrassment for the league yeah. because they don't want to settle this now. Yeah, yeah. So, so look, um, it's an ongoing conversation. In some ways, Victor, and this is the only positive I can see from this, we're having to talk about referees. They're not invisible. They're not evil. They are human beings that know the sport certainly better than most of us. And, and, and you've got to give people like that credit because I can tell you now, most of these refs are not millionaires because of the, the time they've put into this. They have part-time jobs or full-time jobs on top of this. Yeah. And, I, and I think that's at the crux of what's going on here. How they travel. Right. How they travel. The same issue in the NFL. I mean, how can you be... Uh 
a league that's making boatloads of money and you can't have full-time refs. Agreed. Agreed. Doesn't make sense. Doesn't make sense to me. So let's shift gears as we continue here on the Portes Nation, the soccer podcast. Victor, let's talk a little NWSL and in particular the Dash, who this week go off to California to play the team from San Diego in another friendly, but the start uh, of the season's right around the corner for Fran, Al Fran Alonso and his team. All right, we're going to finally get uh, to get a look at them next week and they'll have the final test here. And, and obviously these have been um, closed doors friendlies. I think I think we spoke about one of them here in Houston that was open to these ticket holders. But other than that, uh, everything's been hush-hush around the dash. So. Uh, against the Longhorns, I have to throw that out there. <laughs> So, um, you know, I'm curious to see what, what this dash team is going to finally look like. And obviously in the middle of this, um, without some other stars that are at the, at the Women's Gold Cup. So um, it'll be an interesting start of the season for the dash. And, and again, excited to see what this first game against Fran, with Fran Alonso as a head coach is going to look like. The team is away at, at North Carolina against the, the Courage on the 16th of March. Um, Victor... What do you expect when the team opens up the following weekend? I think it's the 23rd at home. Uh, what is your expectation of support uh, relative to attendance, relative to interest from, from the media? Uh, let's, let's get ahead of that because I think that's part of all this puzzle. Is it being covered enough? We talked about the loss of Maggie, who was an advocate of, 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 of yeah. the Dash. Yeah, she was doing a lot of Dash coverage too, yeah. And, and, and now, now there's also some advocates of women's soccer who we know well, who are no longer covering the team, Victor. And we don't have to name names, but, 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 but is there a change also in the coverage of, 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 of this team? Um, does that make sense, I, where I'm trying to I go think with this? Yeah, I think they've always had challenges. I've always said, for as much as I criticize and, and complain about the coverage that the Dynamo don't get, uh, the Dash have it even worse, uh, probably tenfold. Um, they don't get the same coverage uh, from all mediums uh, because they are lower on, to on the totem pole. They do get lesser importance. I don't know if that's fair. Um, but again, a lot of this goes to the uh, same problem that Dynamo have, the attendance. And I think a lot of, uh, I think a lot of media outlets measure uh, interest based on attendance. So I think you know, indirectly when they're not selling tickets, when they're not filling up the stadium, or just simply not getting people out there, um, people aren't going to pay attention. Look, you don't think stations around town would cover that team if all of a sudden they had a full stadium? Sure. What twenty thousand people for a women's game? What, what, what's going on? They're going to they're going to take uh, get attention, right? If the Dynamo were doing the same thing, I think we, we'd have the same conversation. Oh, look, the Dynamo are pulling in full crowds. What's going on? Let's let's call up to ask. Let's investigate. Um, so by not caring to fill up that stadium indirectly, that that sort you know it affects a lot of you know the other aspects of the sport, a lot of the aspects of these teams. I don't expect you know much more than you know, five thousand, maybe even be generous uh, for what the dash get. And and we've heard Fran Alonso say he wants to see that stadium full. I think it's a long long term vision. Um, and again, the lack of marketing that we see for the Dynamo, we see it even less for the dash. Victor, you just mentioned Fran, Fran Alonso, who just joined in his first season with the Dash. Um, I, I, I bet 95% of the sports fans in our city have no idea who he is. I think that's part of the, the chore, the work that you have to put into this, which is getting out there in the community. And, and it means free, to be honest well, with you. Well, not just him, the players. Agreed. How many people know the players? Agreed. How many people know Maria Sanchez? Uh, many don't. Many don't. Uh, again, I talked to you about Hector Herrera walking to certain parts of town. No one would recognize him. Um, Maria Sanchez, I think, I bet, would be very similar. Um, okay, there's, 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 there's a woman walking through here. Who is she? We, we don't know. Um, how does that manifest itself when it comes to marketing and getting out there? The organization has to do that. The league has to do that, Victor. And there's many ways to do that. You can do it with partnerships locally. You can do it with sponsor partners. You can get out there and, and it, with schools. It's work. It's work. It's not going to be handed. But I do believe this, Victor. I think, and, I, and I'm, maybe it's more hope 
than with evidence in front of me of numbers. I think the women's game is going to continue to improve. I really do. And, and, and I think there's a generational transition again. I'm going to talk about that a lot in the next year where it's no longer the traditional male oriented sports environment. It's women, it's families, it's girls who say, you know what? I can and I want to support women's soccer. I see that at the college and university level. The knowledge is there, the support is there, and the excuses are gone. The chauvinism of the past, Victor, is gone. And, and if you're still a dinosaur stuck in that way, um, I don't think you have much of a future. Appreciate women's soccer for what it is. It's, it's quality work. What's happened right now? Who is that right now, today, taking the headlines for basketball? It's a woman. It's, it's Caitlin who is now the leading scorer in the history of NCAA basketball. And I'm so happy that story is being told, Victor. I think we've turned a corner. I think I remember the days of the WNBA and of the Houston Comets when it was niche and niche within a niche of what that was with no coverage, no respect, no following. It's changing and it's incumbent on us. And I go back to who we just lost, Maggie. That's the generation, Victor, that's going to take it to the next level. Maybe I'm more optimistic than you are about this, but um, that's what I'm hoping happens. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I agree with you on some points. I, I still think, you know, it, it's still soccer, um, and, and that's the product, and that's what you have to market. That's that's who you have to – that's the easiest thing in, in my mind to go after soccer fans. Why, why not go after people that already like the sport? Um, make it an enjoyable experience. Bring them back to the stadium. Um, do what you got to do to – to make it a spectacle. And I think there's a different, maybe there's less restraints that, you know, things that you can do with an NWSL game um, that maybe then what MLS allows, for example, for the Dynamo, um, figure out a way to get more people in there, get a cheaper ticket, get more families in there, um, more college students. Again, whatever you have to do to develop the game, why wouldn't you be doing it? But again, I don't know if the investment is there. Yeah. I don't know if the, I mean, Ted Siegel talks a big game about wanting to support the women's game. And, and he has, um, you know, Maria Sanchez gave her a big contract. And, yes. and I think you can point to some things. Um, but there's other ways too, right? I mean, do the Dash have its own staff? Um, Jessica O'Neill was brought in to be the president of the club. And now she's overseeing everything. Are the Dash going to go back to getting a, a, you know, a staff that, you know, a president that focuses just on that side of of, of the of the club? Um, are they sharing ticket sales uh, with the Dynamo? You know, are they sharing staff like they used to in, in previous days? Is that part time? Is that full time? Uh, I think all these are questions that we can ask about. You know, why? Because it it, it again, it is part of the investment of growing this team. Are the players themselves doing? Um, enough to put themselves out in the community uh to get you know fans out to the stadium do they feel like they don't have to because of you know i don't know what the collective bargaining agreement is or how much it limits um but i think you know when you go back to the early days of soccer in this country i say early but about 40 years ago right even in the men's game i think uh, and you lived this uh, you know having to go the extra mile to sell the sport um you know, is it wrong to ask that of the women's game, um, especially in a city that isn't pulling the crowds? No. Um, or are we just expecting people to show up like they are in Portland and San Diego and in L.A. and saying, hey, it's up to the people to show up because, you know, this is, Victor. you know, if you don't show up, you're not respecting the women's game. I mean, where where do we, it, here's you know, an, here's an analogy. It's a big conversation to have. Victor, here's an analogy. I, 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 I compare where soccer is in general to a band that eventually will become a superstar headlining band but in the early days of local clubs back in my day they were out there putting up paper pamphlets all over the city they were promoting themselves they were asking friends and family to come give them a shot to go to come watch them and that grassroots, maybe that's the term that, that applies here better, it's still necessary. 
getting in front of people, getting out in the community. What is this, an election year? Shaking hands and kissing babies. Trump's going to do it. Biden, if he can remember where the babies are, might do it. That's a joke. That's a joke. Someone's going to get mad at me. Uh, Victor, uh, that's part of this. You, soccer, we are not the NFL. We are not Major League Baseball. Well, the thing that's, we are not the NBA. That, but accept that. Don't, 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 don't that, that, there's nothing wrong with that. We're the next thing. It's coming. It's here. It's actually here. But, 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 but it's, it, it's work. And it's not disrespect, yeah. Victor, to say, well, we have the women's sport. We have women's soccer. And if you don't come, you're disrespecting us. No, it, it's still work. It's still work. Well, it just it baffles me because what you mentioned, uh, you know, the, NF, the, the NFL, MLB, NBA, you know, here locally with those teams, we see those teams go grassroots. That's why it's baffling to me. Uh, the elite teams or, or the, the top level teams um, do these efforts. At the very least, you should be matching what they're doing uh, and getting out in the community and, and doing these media rounds, going out to radio stations, going out to TV stations. If they got a billboard, you should have a billboard. And I know, you know, but, but in, in, I'm, gonna I'm not saying dollar for dollar, but, but certainly you can match some of these efforts and be noticed and, um, but, if you want to be at that level. But, but Victor, here, here's where I'm going to tell you, this is the change. I go back to Maggie because I think this is an important point. The traditional sports media in this town has been controlled, I'm going to say this, by Anglo males. I'm going to be very direct about what I'm saying. I don't think it's a surprise, number one, and I don't think it's inaccurate, and I don't think there was an agenda. But that generation of sports journalists in our city were focused on certain sports because that's what they knew. That's the way they grew up. They didn't grow up playing the sport of soccer. They didn't have women's sports considered equal to men's. They, they, they underestimated. They made fun of the women's, women's sports and said, look, this is what you get. So they did not take women's sports seriously. They did not take soccer seriously. We need more Maggie's because she was changing that, Victor. She was seeing, look, I can present this and it's got the value of the NFL and Major League Baseball. Nobody talks about well, this, Victor, in this city. We just talked about how we're the majority. Can you name any I, Latino, but I English think, speaking I think if you wait, broadcasters that push soccer? The answer is no. They don't exist, Victor. And it's a shame that it doesn't happen. It's a shame because the traditionalists still control sports coverage in this city. I'm not, I'm not upset about it. I think that's just a fact. We need to change this. We will change this. We are changing this. I'll be quiet. Well, I mean, but that's but you got to go out and change it. It's part of it, and you got to play a hand in changing it. You can't just expect uh, the next Maggie to come along and 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 just cover your team. Uh, yeah. You know, you got to put more, um, be more efficient and, and and be more proactive in making making that happen. Inviting. Uh, turning that opinion, changing that opinion. Um, but again, I, I, to me, I just go back to just the, the bare minimum uh, of, of making the rounds, of getting out there, uh, like, again, publicizing your team. Um, that's, that should be the basics. And it, you know, go as far as your money can take you, but, but do it. Go as far as your money can take you. Don't just, uh, don't just stop and, you know, wait for a handout and wait for people to come to you. Victor, we're wrapping up, but let's talk about one more competition, talking about the women's game. We're showing highlights of Mexico-Paraguay, Mexico-Paraguay in the CONCACAF Women's Gold Cup. We now have semifinalists, but talk about the, this match first. Mexico in a tight match, uh, finding a way to defeat the team from South America 3-2. to two. Yeah, went through, and then uh, before that, I don't know if we got a chance to mention it, but uh, Mexico beating the United States in a historic result. Um, and we might be heading that way to, uh, even though we're in the same group, to a U.S. Mexico final, it's like in the men's gold cup. We may, we might get that here. And and the biggest thing, you know, we're talking about attendance in this in this podcast. Um, the Mexican attendance in L.A. Uh, for these games is growing and growing, and we might see a very a pro Mexican crowd uh, certainly here. In, I think in the semifinals and maybe even in the final, despite. The United States, the four-time World Cup champions, being the favorites to win this tournament. Victor, is is that not amazing? Um, that 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 the support 
from Mexico and Mexican fans to the national, the women's national team is here. This is a country, Me Mexico, Victor, and and and, and I was born coming. in Mexico. That that as of as of a few years ago was still discriminating with that chant. Uh, that we're still a machismo culture. This is so refreshing. This is so nice to see, and and I think it's genuine, by the way. And 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 I'm looking forward to another USA Mexico uh, matchup. It's going to become another clásico in in so many ways. But uh, I, I'm excited about this. Now, we can't say that at, at Shell, uh, the stadium was full. It didn't have the draw of a Mexico and a U.S., oh, right? No, but I think the El Salvador fans salvaged so those three games. And I think I was expecting what the third night was. I was expecting that type of attendance uh, for all three games. So I think um, El Salvador's you know, participation certainly salvaged a lot of it and and hopefully we just see this more growing and growing but you know big part of mexico you know it's not overnight uh the support wasn't necessarily uh always there uh, to these numbers i think part of it is uh hey the product got better and how did the product get better mexico finally put a top women's league together and then we're starting to see the fruits of that labor and yeah a lot of the players are, are based in the united states and there's that discussion to be had about how many of, of these players are falling through the cracks right and how many are going to foreign national teams when the U.S. women's national team could be having them themselves, right? Um, but, you know, in the end, I think that is a big part of it. It is the, you know, Mexico is at a different level now, in part because players are getting more playing time. It, you know, they're maybe not afraid as much, right? The U.S. is also going through through a certain period where, uh, you know, it is a, a transition uh, in eras. Um, and also maybe they, they needed a bit of a of a smack in the face to be able to to wake up here and and this is only good i've always said it in the men's game um yeah i root for both partly because it's 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 who i am right it's my nationalities but also yeah. because it only helps the region for both of these to to be competitive and to push yeah. each other to the next level victor we, we 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 we're watching right now the the highlights of colombia versus usa um in in the um CONCACAF Women's Gold Cup, a spirited match. Um, the, the better team, per se, to me, was the United States and what I watched and in the highlights. I, I was a bit disappointed, and I agree with our colleague Glenn Davis, on the, uh, I'm going to use this word, the dirtiness the from antics. Colombia. The <laughs> antics. It's, it's cheap. It's, it's, it's not necessary. It's dramatic for the sake of drama. Just go out and play. And, and, and that's where I am so happy with the women's sport at times that it's so much cleaner with less antics than the men's game that has fallen into and at times really fallen into time wasting, into complaining, into flopping. And, and what I saw from, from the Colombian players, I'm going to say this, trying to find any way to cheat especially when they were down. They were down early uh, in the 23rd minute, second minute, they were already down 2-0. And, and, and it got ugly in that sense. That's not the way to me, for me to coach a team. Go out and play. I know you, you may not have the, the, the firepower that the USA has, but, but play for the purity of the sport. Am I, am I wrong? Am, are we being too, am I being too harsh in this critique? Uh, no, I think, you know, certainly... Number one, it comes from coaching, right? Yes. And that's the way Colombia decided to play. And and I agree with you. I mean, you know, go out and play. You know, if you lose 10 nothing, um, leave the field knowing that you at least gave it all you had. And you leave away with a lesson of where you stand against, yeah. you know, what, what should be the top team in the world uh, because of, of who they are in, in the women's game. And you walk away with something valuable, right? As opposed to you pull these antics and what do you really learn, right? Um, could maybe you put a better game together if uh, you know, the strategy was different? Um, and and again, you cheat the women out of that lesson, the, the players out of that lesson. Well, I mean, that's the way they decided to play. I mean, I, it, it, if it paid off, maybe they say, well, it worked and, and that's what we're betting on and and they'd be in the semifinals, but uh, at least in this case, I think the right team won. Yeah, yeah, I think I think the 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 exciting part of this now is where it wraps up and the different styles for for this 
for this competition. But again, uh, certainly a bright side of all of this, Victor, was was the uh, the 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 people in the stands, the the coverage. Uh, I think this only gets better, and I think we're going to look back, Victor, in 10, 15 years, and remember the days when we couldn't fill up stadiums. And in a few years, I'm really hopeful. I'm optimistic that that's going to change because I think the generations that are coming, not only playing but covering and understanding the women's game, are going to add to to it. So the the last word about the women's uh, Concacaf World Cup, and we'll also show Victor the uh, we'll also show the uh, the bracket of what's left uh, of the competition. Yeah, like we said, it's about time. Uh, even the first Gold Cup, I believe, it wasn't as, as great uh, attendance. But it's what's grown, and and it's good that the women finally have a regional cup that you know isn't just there for qualifying to, you know, an Olympic tournament or or a World Cup. It it's finally to settle, you know, the champion of the region the way it should be, the way Europe has the Euro, uh, the way that South America has the Copa America, and um, this will be interesting to see how the final ends up, and and hopefully, well, I mean, it seems like we'll get a good game, and and certainly plenty to talk about. Yeah, so the uh, semifinals, Canada, USA on the sixth. Um, both matches on the sixth, and then Brazil, Mexico. W what what is your betting telling you? USA, uh, USA, Mexico in the final on the tenth. I think that's the way it goes. But uh, let's see what Canada has to say, right? Um, maybe they can. I mean, they certainly have the talent to be able to pull off a game. Uh, let's see if they can beat the U.S. and and certainly. Uh, let's not count out Brazil. I think uh, there's always that flavor with Mexico, Brazil, when we see it in the men's game. And, and I think uh, here we'll see what the women's game leaves us. We'll see. So that's wrapping up our coverage of the uh, CONCACAF Women's Gold Cup. Victor, as we wrap up today's show, the Deportes Nation, the soccer podcast, what are you looking forward to here in the next couple of days before our next taping? Well, certainly we're going to see the, the CONCACAF Champions Cup here. Uh, Houston going up against Columbus. Uh, I believe we'll see some of the other teams uh, enter this round as well. Um, you know, Inter Miami coming in, um, so we'll get to finally see that level. Uh, they're going to face off against Nashville. Uh, start to see some of the uh, the the better matches uh, in the tournament. Uh, Chivas America uh, will be one of the uh, one of the matchups as well. So that's uh, obviously a super classico, a big rivalry, a home and away. Um, yeah, to me, that's that's kind of where we're focused on. And, and we mentioned getting ready for the, the coming up the NWSL season and, and more of the MLS teams. We, we're also working on um, what's going on with the referees. We have interviews lined up this week with referees, by the way, who are currently locked out. Certainly want to hear their perspective uh, on, on how this fits into professional soccer. And I think deeper... Uh, Victor, one thing I'm looking for this week and the next couple of months, to be honest with you, in this year, is U.S. soccer relative to what they're doing with the U.S. Open Cup. And who is in control of U.S. soccer? Is it the MLS? Is it the MLS owners? Is that first division of men's soccer the only thing that U.S. soccer cares about or is able to do something about? Look, I understand they're dependent on each other. They need each other. But, you know, with these... With U.S. soccer now sanctioning another first division league with USL and with the NWSL, what does that mean? To me, that's diluting what's barely trying to get there. So it's interesting. We'll, and we'll, uh, that's another conversation to have. That's a huge yeah. conversation, I think. Where is U.S. soccer in all of this and also relative to the start of the World Cup, which is just right around the corner? So. A lot, a lot to talk about that's coming up here at the local level, at the national level. Victor, um, what, what, uh, I'll let you close uh, uh, for now. Please, sir. No, that's it. Uh, a lot of good stuff to talk about uh, coming up next week, I'm sure. Uh, as always, you know, at Deportes Nation, look up for us on social media. Leave your comments, leave your suggestions. Uh, we'll find them. We'll put them on this, this show for the next week if, if we get some of those. And uh, yeah, deportsofnation.com, and, and that's where you can find our coverage. We will continue with our coverage of soccer, of sports in general. We are grateful to all of you that follow us uh, through our social media, that follow us on our website, deportesnation.com, that follow us on our app. Uh, find that app, please, Deportes Nation. Uh, and, and we're looking forward to an exciting year. So, Victor, thank you. It's always a pleasure to be with you. On behalf of Victor Adaisa, I'm Alex Parra. Thanks to all of you that follow us here on The Soccer Podcast, part of the Portas Nation.